All right, uh, this morning we're looking at the book of Acts, chapter 6, uh, verses 1 through 7. Let's begin by reading the text. Now, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. The statement found approval with the whole congregation, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. Well, may the Lord bless uh, his word to our hearing this morning, and uh, may he give you the grace to hear, may he give me the, the, the grace and strength to be able to preach it. Uh, Presbytery can take a little bit out of you, but thankfully it was brief because of the uh, situation, uh, of, of the COVID situation. Well, first by way of review last week, remember we saw how Satan was increasing his persecution against the church as the Lord was strengthening his work through the church uh, when God rises up and pushes his kingdom forward, which is what he was doing among his old covenant people. Gospel was advancing and bearing fruit, and multitudes of men and women were being saved. The devil inevitably rises up also to try to stop it. We saw how Satan moved his key players, the leaders of Israel, against it, hoping to bring a swift end to this movement once and for all. Now, I hope we understand, you know, that in, in the kingdom of heaven, there is spiritual warfare, that, that these spiritual forces working in the background is what makes our work to be so difficult. The devil, in particular, who is working through the people of this world and working through this world system, and who is also trying to entice our flesh, these things are all fighting against us. And really, the, the main obstacle that is in our way most of the time, in, in doing what the Lord calls us to do, is simply ourselves, our, our reluctance to want to do these things, the, the flesh, the corruption within us. Well, Satan, of course, makes use of that as well. That's what makes our work so difficult. But we also need to understand that when Satan moves to stop God's work, God also moves to advance his work. I mean, the Lord only allows this resistance of the evil one so that in the end, he might be glorified when he actually overcomes it in the lives of his people. So we saw this, that the apostles were arrested and they were put in jail. The, the empire strikes back, so to speak. But then the Lord releases them and sends them back into the work. Well, then they were again arrested. And on that occasion, the Lord again responded by giving Peter boldness to preach the gospel uh, again, and even to indict the leaders of Israel with the murder of his son, such boldness. But he also used Gamaliel's counsel to back these leaders off and to leave the door open for the work to continue. But again, we see this back and forth struggle. And we see Satan trying to find a foothold somewhere to stop the Lord advancing his kingdom. And so now we see as, the, as God's kingdom continues to grow and prosper... Satan now begins another tact. He begins to plant the seeds of division among the disciples themselves. Now, up to this point, there hadn't been any issues among them. They had been of one mind and one heart, which means they all had the same purpose. They all saw things the same way, which is a wonderful thing. And they also had the same heart towards the Lord and his kingdom as well as one another. And even that sin of Ananias and Sapphira that ended in their deaths had only helped to cement the unity that they were enjoying. But, but now there was a problem. The Hellenistic Jews began complaining, and from what we read in this text, apparently their complaint was a just one, that their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Widows who, 
perhaps were widows indeed who had no help. They weren't getting fed. Now, the work had become too large for the apostles to oversee personally, and things were beginning to slip through the cracks. But to sacrifice the ministry of the Word, obviously, to manage this would have been too costly. And so they founded a new office of mercy to take care of the need, that of deacon. And that's what we want to think about this morning. The establishing of the diaconate to promote the Great Commission. We need to remember, ultimately, all these things are being done for the glory of God and the advancement of His kingdom, even the caring for these widows. So I want us to look at three things. First of all, the problem that existed, the complaint among the disciples. Secondly, the solution, which was the establishing of this office of deacon. And then finally, the result, God's kingdom continued to grow. And of course, when we do the Lord's work, the Lord's way, that's going to be the result, if the Lord is pleased to grant the blessing. So first of all, let's consider the problem in verse 1. Luke writes, now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Now, in this one verse, we see something good and we see something bad. The good was the disciples were increasing. In spite of the persecution that was being brought against them, perhaps even because of the persecution. Remember how um, it's been said in church history, the blood of the martyrs is basically the seed of the church. When people are persecuted for the truth, it causes the church to grow. Well, we see that because of this persecution, the church was continuing to grow. The Lord was working through them to gather the lost sheep of the house of Israel uh, in, in Jerusalem. He was being glorified. And you can imagine what an encouragement this must have been for the early church. Because really, I don't think there is any greater blessing than being used by the Lord to bring honor to His name, especially in bringing His lost sheep home into the fold. You know, the Lord says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I think we understand that. When we give, we, we sense that joy, that pleasure that the Lord gives to us. But I don't think there is any greater joy than sharing the gospel with other people. And I think that's when you sense the Spirit's pleasure, which gives pleasure to you more than anything else that you can do for the kingdom of heaven. So the early church was seeing this, and they were experiencing this, and it was wonderful. That was the good. The bad was discord was developing in the ranks. As the congregation grows, so does the potential for division. More people means, obviously, more differences of opinion. And we know the devil knows that as well, and we know the devil will exploit that, and we know that's exactly what he began to do here. Now, our love and our unity with one another in, in the church as the body of Christ is what Jesus tells us his, is his most powerful testimony to the world that we are His people, when we confess Him before others and we show the reality of that confession by our love. And that's why He tells us that we should work very hard at preserving it. Now, listen to what Paul writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk or to live in, in a manner, a way, worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You see, that unity is a very, very important thing, that love which creates that unity to preserve that. Sadly, in our own experience, I think we've seen within the church, Satan attacks that on a regular basis, and he is very good at doing that. Sadly, I mentioned in my prayer one example of that in the Sonora Church and, and the church that, that they planted. Uh, there's you know, some disagreements, and then there's division. And it's not between those two churches. It's simply a disagreement that took place in the process of bringing Brooke Mose uh, to a place where he could um, be ordained as a minister. 
So that's, that's something we need to be praying for, praying that that unity might be restored. I don't really think there's any reason why it should exist. But again, to preserve this unity, there are certain things that we need. We need to be filled with the Holy Spirit because we can't do this in our own strength. With the power of the Holy Spirit, we need to be willing to forgive those who offend us, those who injure us. And of course, when we need to go to someone to correct them, we need to do that gently and patiently, always bathing our efforts in prayer. And I think if we do this, I should also add in humility, because if we don't do it in that way, we usually end up creating division. We make the breach worse than it was before. So we need these things. We need the Spirit. We need His wisdom. We need His grace. We need His humility. Now, the particular division that they were faced with was this. The Hellenistic widows were going hungry. Now, the Hellenistic Jews, I think you understand from the word Hellenism, were basically Greek-speaking Jews. These were the ones who basically had come from outside of Palestine. Remember when Alexander the, the, the Great conquered the world, he brought one common language, and that common language was Greek, and that meant that everybody throughout his empire could basically communicate with one another. Well, that language continued even after the Greek empire fell and the Roman empire with its Latin uh, emerged. And so these were, again, those from outside of Palestine and parts of the Roman empire who had likely been converted at Pentecost. The native Hebrews were those Jews who lived in Palestine and who spoke Hebrew. Now, the native Jews appear to have been the ones who were in charge of this ministry. Somehow, they had overlooked these Hellenistic widows. Uh, Lonida's lexicon translates this verse in this way. When help was being given out each day, their widows got nothing. That, that's another way of putting it, which... I think it, you know, brings it to, a, you know, makes it clearer. It's more pointed. They weren't just, I mean, being overlooked. Of course, they, they got nothing. So they were going hungry. Now, we're not actually told why this was happening. It might have simply been an oversight. With thousands of Jews having been converted to Christianity in Jerusalem, okay, 3,000, 5,000, more and more being added we have to assume that these people were not all together in one gigantic congregation. They probably had several congregations meeting throughout Jerusalem. And the apostles may not have known, or perhaps those who were distributing the money that was being brought to the apostles may not have been aware of what was going on in all of them. And it's also possible the native Jews could have been biased against these Hellenistic Jews. We know that Satan loves to exploit our differences. But for whatever reason, here was a problem, and it was a legitimate problem. James tells us in James 1, verse 27, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. By the way, this is uh, something we ought to be thinking about too, obviously, is helping orphans, providing for widows and keeping ourselves unstained by the world. That is pure and undefiled religion. But I think you see the importance of taking care of widows. And so the apostles needed to deal with it. Now the problem was, if they were to try to meet this need themselves, something more important would have to be set aside, either in part or in whole, and that would be the Great Commission, the proclamation of the gospel, the ministry of the Word, and that's the one thing that could not be put aside. So I want us to see here the importance of priorities because we can get our priorities jumbled up as well, putting everything else ahead of what is most important, the Word of God and prayer. We've got to put Him first. So with this problem in mind, secondly, we see the Lord's solution to the problem, which was the establishing of a new office in the church, that of deacon. Now, I mentioned earlier that for any of us, really any of us, unless we be, happen to be extremely gifted and very energetic to do anything well, we need to focus all of our energies on just doing one thing. And that would be, you know, the thing that uh, perhaps we're called to do uh, above all other things. Otherwise, if we get too spread out, the things that we do will tend to be not done too terribly well. 
And again, that's why I believe Paul exhorted Timothy to make sure his focus was in the right area in 1 Timothy 4, verses 14 through 16. Again, where he says, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, perhaps the gift of teaching, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear. Does it sound to you like Paul was telling Timothy? He needs to focus on the ministry of the Word. The apostles had their hands full. By the way, when he says the ministry of the Word, this is not just that they were teaching Bible studies every day and just continually ministering in-house. I think the majority of their work was outside the church preaching the gospel to the lost so that they might come. They had their hands full preaching the gospel and praying that the Lord might make that gospel fruitful. You know, the two things have to go hand in hand. The gospel, we need to share that gospel and we need to pray. These are the two most important things that need to be done. And they could not be set aside even for something as important as making sure that these widows were properly cared for, even though that is also very important. But since that need was still important, they called the congregation together and had them choose from among themselves seven men who could oversee this ministry. Now again, by this time, there were thousands of disciples The apostles could not possibly have known all of these people personally. So they left the decision up to the congregation. Choose out from among yourselves seven men because they would have a much better idea of who was actually qualified. Now, this passage, as well as other passages we have where uh, Paul and um, Silas go back to those places where they had preached and churches were formed, Uh, When they ordained men to any office within the church, they they did it through basically an election because the, the people within the church would know better who were gifted and they would be the ones who would desire that gifting and who would call them. So that's what we essentially believe is the pattern God gives to us in the church. Officers are elected by the congregation. The congregation recognizes the gifts. They desire the gifts. They call those men to exercise these gifts for their spiritual well-being. But in order for them, of course, to actually get into the office, they had to meet certain qualifications, as do all church officers. We see the qualifications listed out for us in 1 Timothy, I believe, and also in Titus. In this case, there was also a preliminary set of qualifications. Listen to what they tell them, what they tell the people. Verse 3, therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this work. And by the way, why does God have qualifications for the leaders? Well, it's because He wants qualified men to to do the work, but it's also because He wants an example uh, to the others that they're going to be serving, that they'll have this example also to follow. So these qualifications are things that obviously the Lord wants to work within us as well. So first of all, they had to have a good reputation. They had to be men of integrity. You know, they didn't say one thing and do something else. That integrity had to be seen by other people. They had to be well spoken of in in the community. Lives that were free from scandal, that would be a credit to this office, would bring honor to Christ, and would be an example to the people. They had to be full of the Spirit. They had to have His gifts, His graces necessary to do the work. Uh, One in particular, I would say, if you're going to do the work of a deacon, you have to have a compassionate and charitable heart. You know, you can't can't be Scrooge and and essentially, you know, uh, fulfill that office very well. Okay, they secondly had to be filled with wisdom. They had to know how to carry out this work in a way that would make good use of the resources and that would take care of the needs and that would honor the Lord Jesus. And of course, they had to be men who would not be partial. They wouldn't show favoritism. 
You know, so they wouldn't end up with the same thing that was already happening if that happened to be the cause. So as these men devoted themselves to the ministry of mercy, it would free up the apostles to pursue the more important work that Christ had called them to do. Notice in verse 4, you, you choose these men, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And again, take, let's take care of this need, but let's make sure that we don't overlook the most important things we need to do, which are the two main ways the kingdom of heaven is advanced, not only in the world by bringing people to faith in Christ, but also in the church to disciple and to build up uh, God's people. Now, the congregation, led by the Holy Spirit, agreed with them, and we read in verses 5 and 6, the statement found approval with the whole congregation. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying, they laid their hands on them. One thing that I think is important to note here is that all of these men were actually Hellenistic Jews. And we know that because they all had Greek names. If you're Hebrew speaking, you live in Palestine, you basically give your, your children Hebrew names. And if you live outside, it, apparently um, there were those who gave them, and these are probably, they could have even been, um, oh no, they were Hellenistic Jews. So they were uh, Hellenistic Jews, and they were chosen because it was the Hellenistic widows that were being overlooked. And who better to take care of that need than those who would be perhaps more sensitive to it? So again, they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. By the way, next time we're going to see how the Lord uses Stephen to preach against the sins of Israel's leaders and how he becomes the first martyr, okay? Then we see Philip, who later becomes an evangelist, the one who goes down to Samaria and preaches the gospel to them, the one who then goes to the Ethiopian eunuch and preaches the gospel to him. And we later see him called Philip the evangelist. And that reminds us that just because somebody is, is chosen to serve as a deacon doesn't mean that he can't later be used by the Lord for something else. You know, it, whatever the person is gifted to do, that's what they ought to be doing. And then we see this other list of men, Prochorus, Nicanor, T uh, Timon or Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. We don't really know much about them. We don't really know anything outside of the fact that we're chosen for this purpose except that some believe Nicholas was the founder of a sect known as the Nicolaitans, which are mentioned in Revelation 2, Revelation 2, verses 6 and 15. Uh, something we know about from history, a group that believed that they should be, as, as, a, as a people, they should share everything in common, basically like the early church was doing, and certainly nothing wrong with that, but they believed that should also include their wives. And that's something very wrong with that, something that Christ would never condone, something he condemns. Well, he did condemn it in Revelation chapter 2. Now, if Nicholas, this Nicholas was actually the one who did this, then there was a Judas among the seven, just like there was a Judas among the twelve. But we don't know that for sure. Others believe that the Nicolaitans may have just taken their name from him and that he wasn't really involved. But they brought these men to the apostles and whether they just accepted the fact that, you know, the testimony of these men or whether they examined him, we don't know. We do know that we're not to lay hands on anyone too hastily, so they made sure these men were qualified. They then prayed for them that God would give them grace and wisdom to discharge this office for His glory. And then they laid their hands on them, ordaining them to this office, conferring on them the authority to use it for the good of the church. And that's essentially what deacons are, servants of the church who minister the gospel in a ministry of mercy and compassion to make sure the needs of God's people are, are cared for and, and to encourage them. And, and actually, once that is taken care of, if our resources are greater, it can also become a means of evangelizing by reaching people who are outside the church, though we have to be very careful with that today today. 
Because when, you know, somebody comes to the church and you help them, it isn't long before you have lots of people flocking to the church who may not necessarily qualify for help because um, of the lifestyle they've chosen. Uh, we know there's, again, many people who fall into that category. Well, the Lord gave them deacons, and we need to pray that if the Lord sees that we need them, that He would give them up to, the, to give deacons to us as well, that He would give to us ruling elders so that His work would move forward. All right, well, finally, we see the result, which is the, exult, uh, the result we would expect. God's kingdom continued to grow, verse 7. The Word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. Now, I think what this tells us is that when things are done God's way, when we put the gospel and prayer first, God blesses the work. His word continued to be proclaimed, the disciples continued to grow in number, and even many of the priests were being converted from Judaism to Christianity. And when you stop and think about it, that's especially interesting because the priests were those who probably had most to lose, didn't they? I mean, to be a priest was a great honor, being in the line of, of Aaron, but we need to realize, too, that that was their employment, that was their work. That's how they provided for themselves and for their families. And if the priests were to convert to Christianity, that would mean that they would lose all of these things. You know, those who sacrifice the most for the Lord Jesus Christ, when this, you know, costs them something, those are the people who are most likely converted because you're not going to make that sacrifice if you don't really love the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, they were willing to do this to honor God, and for this we have to believe the Lord undoubtedly honored them by taking care of their needs. So this passage reminds us that uh, when we put the Lord's priorities first, which we will when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, when we put the gospel first, when we put sharing the gospel with others first, when we put His Word and following His Word first, and when we add to that prayer, the kingdom of heaven advances. So here is the recipe for seeing really the church grow not only locally, but also in general to see the kingdom of heaven expand. The church needs to put this priority, you know, it needs to have this priority. I think I told you before, you know, in the past when oh, Don and I were a part of what we would call a mega church, probably had um, maybe 5,000 people, you know, 5,000 people who, who believed themselves to be members of that church that they had two morning services, and both services would be full. The auditorium would be packed. They had one evening service, and that one evening service did not pack out the, um, the building. So you had two full in the morning, but you couldn't even fill one in the evening. But when it came to the prayer meeting, you couldn't even fill the first two rows out of the, the theater being packed twice on a Sunday morning. Now, what that basically tells is that there weren't that many people there that were really committed to, to the work, even in a church that is, that is that large. And that's what we should assume from the churches that we see. Just because there's large congregations filled with people doesn't mean that those people are putting their priorities where they should be. It doesn't mean the kingdom of heaven is going to be advancing. What usually happens is you have all these people who give money and they say, well, that money's enough, that I'm doing my share, and then I'm just going to go and do my own thing. And then that church uses that money to advance the gospel. So those bigger churches do end up advancing the gospel, but not nearly as much as they could if everybody within the church was actually putting their priorities first. And that's what the Lord calls us to do. Actually, if we did that in the, with a small number we'd have, we'd have the same number as the big churches that, that do that. We'd probably have as much work going on in that regard as well. So we need to pray that God would help us to do that in whatever way that we can. That doesn't mean that we all go out on the streets and preach the gospel, but it does mean that we spend time in prayer with Him every day, get alone with Him and seek Him or together in couples and so forth and that we begin to build bridges and tell other people about the gospel. Well, let's pray that the Lord would give us the grace uh, 
to do these things because, as I said before, we can't outgive God. If we put ourselves into this work, whatever it costs us, the Lord is going to give us back many, many more times. And particularly just that sense of joy and pleasure in the Holy Spirit that we are doing that which He wants us to do. God blesses us when we do that. Well, let, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's pray that, that He would help us to do that.